The Tom Woods Show, episode 1514. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you've ever considered publishing a book through Kindle, I have a lot of experience with it. I helped to publish Bob Murphy's book in Kindle, my own book, Real Descent, that was self-published, I published in Kindle, and I've assembled some videos that will show you step-by-step all the tech aspects of preparing your manuscript to be published as a Kindle book, and also a series of strategies that most people don't know about that Kindle itself makes available to you to help get the word out about your book so people actually see it and buy it. Get these videos for free at tomwoods.com slash Kindle. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am very glad to have Michael Malice once again on the program. You know Michael Malice by now. Television personality, celebrity ghostwriter, where he's been a New York Times bestselling celebrity ghostwriter, by the way. And he is also the author in his own right, most recently, of the book The New Right, A Journey to the Fringe of American Politics. And today we are going to talk about a topic that I dare say has never been discussed on this program that is deeply personal and that perhaps may encourage someone in some way. I I don't know, but it was something we felt like we wanted to talk about. And that is, frankly, how we have coped with difficult situations in our lives. And in light of the recent uh, Mental Health Day, or I guess, well, I'll ask Michael, I can't remember uh, the actual name of it, but we decided that might be an interesting topic for us to explore in a free-form sort of way. Michael, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. It's been a long time. I don't remember the last time I had you on, but... I'm glad we're talking. Now, as we record this, not as it's being released, I'm recording a few episodes in advance because I'm going to Philadelphia next week, a city you and I both like. Love it. Love it. And I want to get these uh, out of the way. So I thought, uh, well, when I'm desperate and I can't think of anybody else to have on, (laughs) that's not true. You're the number two guest on the Tom Woods show. And you're the number two funniest person on this call. (laughs) Uh, let me just actually make a point about Philadelphia that will be of interest to the listeners, okay. which is Cuomo had passed some bill where you couldn't get your own health information as a private citizen in New York. To wit, 23andMe, right, which is this DNA testing, you spit in a cup, you mail it to them, and they find out your ancestry. You weren't allowed to mail it from New York State. I had to have my friend mail it from New Jersey. That was one. Two, before Cuomo, or at a certain point during his reign, you couldn't ask for your own blood work. I don't mean drug tests. I mean, if I wanted blood work done, I could not get it done without a doctor's prescription. So what I had to do once is I took the train to Philly and had a great day there. I lied that I lived in Philly. They are not allowed to ask for your ID, or at least they didn't. Um, and I remembered the address of a clothing store I liked there when they asked. Uh, now that's been changed, but I mean, talk about like, the insidious power of the state. That is, that's just awful. Yeah. It's like they're just looking for things to irritate you with in a case like that. And who knows, maybe it's some kind of lobbying thing on the uh, insurance industry. I don't know. Yeah. But it it was just amazing that like, I can't go and find out my blood test, my blood type, excuse me. Well, I'm paying a phlebotomist, licensed, you know what I mean? Licensed phlebotomist, I'm paying out of my own pocket. This isn't, information isn't used to get me a job. It's, you know, nope. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I don't even know how they justify that. I, I I can't even wrap my head around it. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, when I told folks last week that you were coming on. Wait, if you told them before you asked me, that's presumptuous. No, <laughs> no, no, no. This is before. Trust me, the timing all works out. I told people that we would be talking about social media etiquette. And I know people thought, OK, that is a perfect topic for Michael Malice because I follow him on Twitter. If you're not following Michael Malice on Twitter, by the way, let me just say at Michael Malice, get over there and do it. If you're not blocked. If you're not blocked. And you may be blocked and you have no idea why and you're never going to know. That's just one of those things. You're never going to know why. Anyway, I'm on there. I can do almost, I can get away with almost anything with Michael, but most of you can't. So watch yourselves. Anyway, it's great entertainment. I mean, just looking at Michael's Twitter feed at the end of your day is a nice way to end your day and and drift off to a, a peaceful sleep, knowing that somebody like Michael is out there policing idiocy. In his own way. <laughs> you know, I, I said this on an episode of my show. There have been, and I've mentioned this before, many people, at least five or six, who are like, I'm going through chemo and I read your tweets to cheer me up. 
And I, and I, I invariably tell them, why would you want to read cancer when you have cancer? Oh, <laughs> but it's, 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 um, it, it messes with your head to hear this. Do you know what I mean? Cause I'm just sitting at home being a jerk and then it's making someone's day better. I mean, it, it's, yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, there's a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And it's, it's so interesting, especially when, you know, you're like you and me and we have a lot of people who listen to us and we don't know most of these people and they really, even just when we're not doing something, you know, like fun, like Twitter, but just doing our ordinary day-to-day work, how much enjoyment people get out of it and you get nice feedback. It's, uh, you know, it's not a bad life to have, you know, it yeah. beats digging ditches, as I say. Oh, that, look at that elitist snob. Tom. Yeah. <laughs> well, we couldn't have all gone to Columbia College. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I won't bring up your four-year experience. That'll be for another oh, another episode. No, all right. No. So, so, but you were telling me as we record this, it's uh, it's Friday the something of, what the heck is it? 11th. The 11th? Yeah, the 11th of October. So you were saying that the day before today was something like mental health awareness or something like that? World Mental Health Day. World Mental Health Day. Okay. And you said maybe we could say a little something about this, a uh, little bit off the beaten path kind of topic about, frankly, what you and I do or have done to deal with, let's say, challenging situations? Yeah. I, I mean, this is something that – I come from the RAND school, as you know, and, and a lot of listeners know. And this is something where I think Nathaniel Brandon, her protege, added a lot. Um, if you read her old magazine, The Objectivist and the predecessor of The Objectivist Newsletter, like him and her were at were contributing, I think, roughly 50-50 or something thereabout – Many of his essays before he was, you know, purged from her circle were found in her first book, um, her uh, first original book of essays, uh, the virtue, well, it was original reprints, The Virtue of Selfishness, and then in Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. And when they had their falling out, he had the point that many of Rand's books are, uh, uh, he wouldn't use this term, but it's a, this is where the term is accurate, psychologically problematic. And I think there's a lot to that. And I think it's important or useful, at least, I don't like using the word important, that when people, it's not enough that, oh, you you know, you, you have good principles politically and culturally. I mean, it's important to have techniques to deal with tough things in your life. And that's something that is, I always find it very helpful when people who I like and admire uh, discuss what they do, because also whenever you're in a dark place, you always think no one's ever been in this place before and no one can understand it. And and it, it, the insidious part is at some point your brain starts telling you you deserve it and you don't. Well, some of you do, but you in the main, you don't. You know, there's, there's a lot that we could say here. I mean, sometimes with you and me, one thing that has been, and this won't help in every situation, but you can find yourself in a really bad spot and your mind begins racing to all the bad scenarios that could occur or just yeah. just or it just it just goes to a hopeless spot it's called but catastrophizing yeah what you sometimes need to do is face head on well what exactly would happen if x or y like for example mike cernovich gives a has a presentation where he's talking about people who are afraid of public speaking and they're i mean deathly afraid of public speaking and then he says all right now let's go through the outcome, if you got up and gave a really bad speech somewhere, okay? Now let's process, what does that mean? What, what How would that affect you? What would, what would happen? It would mean you're Tom Woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I give up. I give up. Hey, that's a great outcome. Look look how good it is. You could be Tom Woods. Just give yeah. a crappy talk. Yeah, just give a crappy talk. And yeah, a lot of great things follow from that. But, but what he was forcing them to realize was that, so what? Yeah, I mean, people have given crappy talks. And then within an hour, everybody's forgotten about it. You know, your life goes on. I mean, you, like when you stop and actually face it head on, is now obviously there are some situations this doesn't apply to, but there are a lot where you've built things up to the point where you're not being rational anymore. Right. And if you can think about what actually, suppose the worst happens, I would still, yeah. I would still get by. But, but for me, the key thing is I went through a, let's say, a big, big chunk of my life just not telling people about problems I was having. And that was partly because I didn't care what they had to say, but (laughs) but it was mainly because I was the sort of guy other people went to with their problems. Right. 
And I liked, frankly, projecting the image of a guy who had no problems, right? Right. I'm, I, I've got this perfect life. I have, you know, I, I don't want to be in that vulnerable spot of having to be just as human as everybody else. I mean, let's just be blunt about it. And the biggest breakthroughs I've had in bringing about my own personal happiness and coping with problems as they've come up is chucking all that and being willing to say, at least to close friends, this is what's going on behind the curtain here. And I can't figure out how to fix this and whatever. And, I'll, and I'm going to be extremely uh, open about this. Frankly, it's been you <laughs> who's helped me get through an awful lot of things, being able to call you up and talk about what's going on. And you know the, all the circumstances. And I mean, there have been times where things were really, really bleak for me. I mean, right now, right now I can say in 2019, October 2019, I'm probably happier than I've ever been in my entire life. I can I can genuinely say that, that I've gotten through some really, really rough things and it's great, but it was not great for a long time. And there were times when I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to do anything. Um, I, and What's the point? Like you almost wanted to get on a plane and get down and make sure I was doing these things. Like that's how bad it was. No one could ever tell this based on my show. They listen to my show and I'm happy and everything's going great and I have great kids and I have all these wonderful things and I'm, you know, reasonably prosperous and all that and you know, sort of well-liked in some circles. And, you know, it seems like everything is great. They would never, ever have guessed that it, there were really dark th things going on. And I, in a way, I kind of want to say this partly so that people don't go through life thinking only they have problems. And if only they could have perfect lives like these other people, not so. Yeah, the, the metaphor I use is uh, every weightlifter has a weight that they can't lift. Right at a certain point, the weight's not budging. Doesn't mean they're weak. It means they have a limit. This is universal. So yeah. same thing with every person. It, when people don't realize that if you are someone who your friends respect and you're having a tough time, they don't think you're someone who they disrespect. They think this is someone I respect who's having a tough time. Just like you don't think that weightlifter is weak, you just think, okay, he can't lift that weight. And it's very hard for us to accept. The other problem I would say in terms of advice is this is something that's very helpful when it comes to getting older. Because when you're in your college in your early 20s, you're having these problems and whatever they are professionally, personally. And the only people you know to turn to for advice are your dopey friends. And sure, they're going to give you advice because they get their advice from watching TV and, and cartoons and what have you and, and YouTubes. Uh, but they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And so it's not helpful and you're spiraling. And I think when you get older, you develop a lot better techniques. And more importantly, you have a lot more data. And what I always do is there, my, my friend Jackie, who you know, Wacky Jackie, um, she, there's this quote she has, which is, uh, if it's hysterical, it's historical, Right. So people who have gone through trauma of some kind, and you know that word uh, has a. I'm going to use it in the loose sense. By trauma, I don't mean you know you lost your leg or you know you were assaulted by a family member. It could you know being fired is a traumatic you know experience. You know something that's an intense short term shock. You know that messes up your kind of uh, a sense of reality. What happens in the future? Like another time when you had a job you didn't really like and you might be fired, you're going to have that same emotional experience that you had the first time, and you might not have the presence of mind to realize it, then you're freaking out completely out of proportion, then you're freaking out about why you're freaking out. So when that happens, when you are really in this kind of meltdown place, uh, one technique that is very useful is take a step back and be like, okay, this is something echoing through time. What is this actually about? And when you realize that you're like, okay, this is about this other time. And then you tell yourself, well, could you have handled that? It sucked. Did you get through it? Well, you're here now. So that if it does, it might not calm down the physical aspect, the adrenaline, that sense of tension. But uh, in a logical sense, it allows you to breathe and kind of localize what your brain is doing to you. And there's something else you said about catastrophizing, which is very, very uh, useful, which is sometimes you're, you'll have something really awful happen to you. Again, let's pretend you're laid off and you're walking around and you're like, what's the point? 
I'm laid off, this and this, you know, I don't have a girlfriend, whatever, my shoes don't fit. And you have to stop and tell yourself, if you had a job right now, you wouldn't have a girlfriend either. Your brain in that situation is your enemy and starts acting like a magnet and tries to attach every bad thing going on at once into one big ball. And you have to take that step back and argue with it and be like, you're just throwing things on top of this pile to try to make me feel worse. And these are non sequiturs, even though on an emotional level, it feels logical. For some reason, that reminds me of being a college freshman and being told by the, it was called a proctor, but most people call them resident advisors, that a lot of us are going to go into our first classes as freshmen feeling very unsure of ourselves because we're at an elite school and maybe maybe we were the mistake that the committee made, that sort of thing. And yeah. you're going to be in a classroom with people who will will know a lot of things. And when they're answering questions, they'll seem to they'll seem to have a lot of knowledge. But what you're what you're failing to realize is student A will give an answer to some question, then student B will answer something, and student C. But in your mind, you kind of imagine it all being like one blob of knowledge. Like like it's, it's but it's not that student A knew the answers to all those things. Each one had a little bit of knowledge, but in your mind, you kind of think of it's me against this blob and look at how much the blob knows. But the blob's not an entity. It's just individuals and you have stuff that they don't know. But it's just, it's amazing how your your mind, if you don't keep an eye on it, can really become your enemy. Yeah, it's, it, it's like imagining you're having a debate, a scholarly debate. You can fill in your stupid punchline here about me, Tom. Um, and it's going to be on one side, Tom, and the other side, the rest of the class. Yeah, you would probably lose that debate. But that doesn't happen. That's not how debates right, work. Right. Debates are one-on-one. -on -one. So this sense that your brain is like it's me, me versus the world, they're not on a team. And that team is not united in opposition to you at all. But you have to tell your mind that you're being uh, – you're self-isolating. Uh, and, and this is the thing. It's very hard for many people – to have empathy, by which I mean seeing things from other people's perspective and realizing, yeah, every single person in this room has X amount of knowledge and lacks a lot of other knowledge and is looking at everybody else in the room. They're one unit in this subset, just like you. Now, at the same time, I, it's not everything that you might face can be handled with some technique that you might learn somewhere. Like, for example, I have a daughter who – she has everything imaginable going for her, but she had a bit of a self-esteem problem for a while. Sure. And I would try to deal with that by telling her about all her good qualities. And these are, uh, these are objectively true. I mean, anyone can see these qualities in her. This isn't just her dad talking. But now she has a boyfriend and she's on cloud nine and she's had this boyfriend for numerous months now. And that, ha that experience meant more than a hundred lectures from her dad about what a great person she is. You know, because I can... There are things that you need to come to see for yourself that I can't bring you there. I can't take you to that place. I don't place. think that's what that is. Here's my interpretation of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I'll give you a parallel example that's not with your kid. First of all, from her, what her brain is telling her, I would bet, is, oh, he's your dad. He has to say these things. Yeah. Yeah. And where is the proof that I'm a quality person? And then when she finds someone, finds her, you know, engaging and attractive. Okay. I had something uh, uh, similar happen to me. I had a very good friend, very close. He haven't even had the passwords to my website. I mean, that level of closeness. And then one night he ghosted me. We've never had an argument. We never had a disagreement. Uh, and it really messed me up. Uh, I, I still don't have an explanation. And now I've come to understand if you're going to do something like that, that's on them, not on me. Uh, if, if, you know, if you, that, that's just not um, appropriate or, or doesn't follow. And then I was on Kennedy's show, you know, often. And she told me that, or one of her staff or both told me that I was her favorite guest. And then it, it made me realize, I'm like, wait a minute, how hard, because when someone goes to you, it, it, it's jarring. You're like, am I this awful of a person that someone isn't even going to bother having a discussion? They're just going to be like, throw you in the garbage, you know? Uh, and breakups are the same way. And I go, wait a minute. Kennedy's been on TV since like the 90s. She's interviewed hundreds of people. If I'm even close to the top and she finds me of interest or value, clearly 
I can't be a terrible human being. And that really kind of uh, reassured me in that regard. So it's tough because, you know, the, the brain, I want most, you know, it's like writer's block. Writer's block, you know, which most people understand if they've not experienced it, they understand the concept. Writer's block is your mind turning against you. Rand, as an example of writer's block, called it tennis shoes, by which she meant was she, she was going to sit down and write. And then her brain's like, well, she gets to make some coffee. All right. It's like, oh, you know, you should uh, um, uh, go for a walk, clear your head. All right, I'll do that. And then she sits down and right, and her brain's like, you know, you got to wash your sneakers, your tennis shoes. They're they're dirty. And this is the mind doing everything in its power to prevent you from doing work. I remember the, I I had this epiphany because I was at the gym once, and I had like one more set to do, and my brain's like, oh, go home. You have to go write this article. And this set would take what ninety seconds. Right. And I'm like, you don't want to exert yourself. And from an evolutionary perspective, you can understand why the brain wants to conserve energy as much as possible. And it's like, oh, just because you talk in my voice doesn't mean you're telling the truth. It means that you are actually uh, in opposition to what I want. And when you have that realization that your brain is often uh, um, your enemy and pernicious, uh, in these regards, it's also very helpful. A couple things on that. First of all, with regard to Kennedy, I was watching Ken. I was watching you on Kennedy not that long ago, and you had been absent from the show for a little while. And more than once, she looked at you and said, "I missed you so much." And, <laughs> and I thought that was just the sweetest thing, almost the sweetest thing I think I've ever seen a host say to a guest. It was so nice. So it, I, I was very happy actually watching that. And um, you know what? Can I say something else? Yeah, like what yeah. you said with Veronica, I, I would also encourage people. I, I think uh, it, it's really good if you have people in your life that you care about and value to just it's going to be awkward, but do it. Tell them, you know what? I'm glad we're friends. You're an awesome person. And many people have never heard that. And it they it would I mean, we don't know how people are raised very differently. And when they hear it, they might get uncomfortable. They may feel weird, but it's a really good thing to do, in my opinion. You know, you're right. I should be doing that. I mean, every once in a while I do something like that, but I really should be doing that because I have friends in my life that are such an amazing gift to me. And and then you have Bob Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, so that was the first thing I was going to say. Second thing, um, I'm going to ref- I'm going to link on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 1514, to a book I've actually talked about because I had the author on, um, Michael Edelstein out on the West Coast, has a book called Three Minute Therapy. That's really, really helpful because that really, it helps you to understand what's, what your brain is doing to you. Like It helps you to understand the false things that it's telling you and how to attack it. It's very... I find most books like this to be just useless platitudes. This is actually actionable advice that I think genuinely would would help you. And then finally, the last thing I would say, and at risk of sounding like a platitude myself, I've, you know, I've I've gotten to know a number of people who have suffered from depression. And I think it's true of a lot of known, us. Known or caused. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for some people, who have not experienced it, they treat depression all wrong. They think, they honestly think it's just a matter of, I got to cheer this person up. Yeah. You know, and that is not what they're facing. And it's, it's a real phenomenon and it's paralyzing. Yeah. And it's from getting to know people who have basically lifted themselves out of it and, and coped with it that I've learned about things like, frankly, I, I mean, again, I know it sounds like a cliche, but things like self-care. Yeah. Which is anything from hygiene all the way to allowing yourself to have free time, doing things that you enjoy. And that sounds obvious to most people listening to this, but it was not to me because for a long time, it was if I have free time, I need to be reading more books. Or if I have free time, I need to be writing more articles. So if I have free time, I can't actually have free time. So I can't just say, tonight I'm going to relax and watch a movie. No, I, what? No, I have to read this book. Or I have to do this and that. And that in the long run is not going to – was not helping me. Uh, it, it was putting me in a, an unsustainable path, if I may borrow Austrian business cycle language. And I needed – like I would tell you things like this I, and say, yeah, I feel like I can't just sit and enjoy myself. And it, you would just be flabbergasted that no, you got to get yourself out of that, man. 
Yeah, and, and it, first of all, as as cliched as it sounds, it actually is extremely beneficial for the business end because if you don't recuperate and give yourself pleasure and happiness, uh, it's it's gonna the work's gonna become a grind as opposed yeah. to you know a part of my day that I enjoy that's allowing me to you know they feed onto each other. There's two techniques, three uh, techniques I use. One is uh, for every all the money I generate. Um, 10% I set aside for my fun fund and that money has to be wasted on fun things. It could yeah. be restaurants, trips, clothes, books, something fun. You have, cause we, you know, especially people like you and I who are self-employed making that transition is really tough at first. Yeah. You yeah. Ha- like I spent many a night in that subway station waiting for the next train to come because I did not have that $20 for the cab. And I spent, I stood there, you know, I remember vividly many for a long time. Um, so that's, and so when you have that $20 for a cab, you think, well, maybe I just have it now. I won't have it next year. So I still wait for the, you know what I mean? Yeah, so right. that is something you have to force yourself, take 10% or whatever percent, put, put some money aside and it has to be wasted. And it's also psychologically helpful to know that you have some money to waste, uh, that you're not uh, one step away from being a destitute. That's number one. Uh, two, there is, I take magnesium. And this is something that, especially men, uh, it, the bottle costs you five bucks. Um, I, it has had very positive uh, effects on my mental well being. Try it. You don't like it, you wasted five bucks. I mean, talk about cost benefit analysis. If the benefit is like you're profoundly happier and more content every day, and the, the possible cost is what you lose five dollars, this is a very, it's like the opposite of Russian roulette. The other thing is there is something called halt, which is if you are bugging out in some sense, anxiety or depression, it's H A L T. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely or are you tired? And a lot of times we aren't aware that if your blood sugar drops or you're hungry, that can, your brain is so articulate, your mind is so articulate that you think, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's not what's going on. It's just feeling, it, what happens is you feel the emotion first and then your rational brain finds a rationalization for this emotion, but that rationalization is not actually the case. The case is you just need to eat something and then you'll calm down because that rationalization will then be blown out of complete proportion. Oh, that's, this is going to sound trivial, but I was on a plane to London not long ago, that last week. And I could, I don't know why I was so hungry. I couldn't wait for them to bring that. Actually, it was really decent airplane food. For some reason, like everything was setting me off. I, I couldn't make good decisions. I couldn't be. And then my companion realized you're starving, right? <laughs> and and honestly, it changed my whole outlook on yeah. things once I had yeah. re- realized that that was that was what was going on. Um, what do you think of this argument we hear a lot? I think it's very plausible that a lot of times people go on social media, particularly Facebook, and they scroll through, and their friends are all on fancy vacations and having children and smiling, and they think everybody's life is better than mine. Do you think there's something to that? And it and it makes people frustrated. Oh, I think in those cases, it's true. <laughs> Their lives are better and your other person's a loser. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, you can't, like you just said earlier, you're not, when you look at social media, you're not looking at um, a person's life. You're looking at their presentation of their life. And then there's also people who don't want to understandably overshare on social media and talk about personal stuff. So you're really only seeing one aspect of someone's life. And that's a very bad metric. And I want to make one more point which is, I think this is going to really hold true to listeners of your show. The most, I think, worst time of someone's life who's ambitious and smart is 24 to 27. Because that's when you're old enough where your friends who don't have ambition and are going to be NPCs basically kind of settle down and and lock into the, you know, kind of like a... um, like a trolley, they get into those tracks and they're never going to deviate from them until the day they die. So those fall away and you're the one who wants to make something of yourself. No one around you does. And now you're very much self-isolated. You have no one to ask because if you ask them about advice, you look like a freak. 
So it's really a very uh, um, isolating and and you're also not old enough or experienced enough or intelligent enough to accomplish anything yet, really, unless you're a huge outlier. So you and you also at that age have that enormous sense of hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Why hasn't it happened yet? You know what I mean? Like that that impatience. So these combinations together when you're young and talented and ambitious really, really will screw you up. And I have no advice other than to tell you this is normal. Yeah, this is universal. I'm sure you felt this way at that I age. Absolutely I absolutely did at that, that I age. I haven't yep. asked you, and I knew it. Yep. And you're like, you're like, am I, am I? What do I do? Uh, I, it hasn't happened for me yet. Maybe it's never going to happen. Should I just kind of, you know, fade into the shadows like these other people? But that's giving up. But I have to give up. Nothing's happening for me. Blah blah blah. It's it's really, really, really a rough transition. So all I could tell you guys and girls who are at that age is like, it's okay, it's normal, it's gonna be this way, and just hang in there. And that's crappy advice, but I'm telling you, it's not unique to you. And I think that would make me feel better if I, at that age, I was told like, no, 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 this, this is, this is how it works. Yeah, everybody at that age goes through. Exa- I had exactly, exactly those thoughts that time. And by the way, it doesn't help that we have people in our you know, let's say our intellectual uh, pedigree who like Murray Rothbard, who were so overwhelmingly productive as young people that you sometimes you implicitly compare yourself to him. Well, look, by age 36, he had already done X and Y, and, you know, Z and I'm 38 or whatever it would be. And you, you just don't do that. I mean, first of all, he had no children. And if you have children, then that's going to take some of your time. But also don't compare yourself to like a once in a century kind of prolific person. This is... And You're I gonna also, kill yourself. I'm not here to knock Murray Rothbard, but like I think it was Hoppe, right, who gave that talk that when he met Rothbard, his office didn't even have a window. Yeah, you know what I mean. So it, it's and Rand is another one. Like, oh, at 38, she had written the Fountainhead. She was like very much socially isolated in many ways, except for like her circle around her. Uh, it's it's and you know she was a workaholic. Um, and yes, she achieved happiness through her accomplishments, but there was also you know, an enormous sense of uh, resentment because she was dismissed and ignored and derided. And I, when Atlas Shrugged came out, this monumental accomplishment, she was complaining fairly. She's like, I wish just one quality mind came forward and said, wow, this book is awesome publicly and it didn't happen for her and and she was flabbergasted and we can understand why in retrospect but yeah so it, it, it's and the other you know I, I make this example maybe in, in the new right I don't remember where but like you look at like Hollywood celebrities right and they're wealthy and they've got these amazing houses and they're sleeping with these gorgeous people and everyone wants their autograph and it's like is there any group that is universally as understood to be as you know, screwed up psychologically and prone to drug, drug self-medication and all this other stuff. It's, it's, it's so you, we all tend to think, I remember there's a band I love, one of my favorite bands, the Go-Go's from the eighties. And there was a behind the music on VH1 about them and Jade Weedlin, who was rhythm guitar, you know, was just kind of sarcastically recounting her memories when they were starting out. She's like, Oh, I can't wait till we're famous. And then we're all going to be happy. And it, she's like laughing at like what idiocy that was. We tell ourselves if X happens, I'm going to be happy. And that is the most stupid counterproductive means of thought possible because you don't know what's going to make you happy. That's not what happiness works. You could say, if I go to the store and give them a dollar, I will get an apple. Yeah, you can make that case. Happiness, it's not that way. Um, and here's another uh, example that's often used, which I'm sure will be very familiar to many of your listeners which is that allegory about the woman who had a kid with Down syndrome, right? And the, the story she tells is, oh, you know, I bought a ticket for, for France. I've always wanted to go to France. And instead the plane landed in Sweden and I didn't want to go to Sweden. I thought Sweden is terrible. And that I'd been in Sweden, I kind I'm, I wouldn't do, you know, change it for anything else and it's wonder, right? And it's kind of like, oh, you have a kid with Down syndrome. You think this is a big calamity and she loves her kid more than anything. So yeah, we think, oh, these are the conditions necessary. That is really, really, really bad. And this is the example I use in my book of, you know, my hero Camus, uh, the myth of Sisyphus, where Sisyphus is sentenced to hell to roll a rock up a hill. 
And every, at the last possible minute, the rock falls away and he has to do it all the time, you know, over and over for eternity. And Camus talks about Sisyphus being happy. And the thing is, it's like instead of focusing on X, Y, Z has to happen. If you're focusing on, you know what, I'm having a great journey and I'm enjoying what I'm doing and who knows where this is going to end up. And then where it ends up is kind of the kind of the exciting adventure. That's a much, in my experience, healthier mindset. Michael, I think we'll, unless you have other points you want to make, I think we'll call it a day. Where can people follow you? What's the easiest way to do it? Well, you know, uh, they'll be on the show notes page. You can follow me on Twitter. And I apologize for advance for uh, um, my vulgarity. Oh, well, <laughs> that's half the fun. No, but, and by my vulgarity, I mean my communications with the common people. Yeah, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. Well, tomwoods.com slash 1514 is the show notes page. We'll have links to Michael's program, You're Welcome. We'll have, well, we'll have uh, last two books. We'll, it, it, the whole Michael Malice smorgasbord can be found at tomwoods.com slash 1514. All right, well, this took a turn, this particular episode, that I didn't expect at all, but I'm glad we did it. I don't know if it, makes people feel better or is helpful to them in some way. But I don't know. I'm glad I, even though some of what I said is maddeningly vague, I still feel better for having said it. And I'm glad we did this. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Tom. All right, folks, if you enjoy and appreciate what I'm doing here, I would really be delighted to see you inside the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is my elite group. And I have many, many bonuses awaiting you, many goodies, many things I want to give you. Let me give you these things. Let me give them to you. Head over to supportinglisteners.com if you feel like this program is benefiting you. And I've got still more goodies to give you if you jump on board there with me. So you belong inside the Tom Woods Show Elite. And the way to get in there is via supportinglisteners.com. I'll see you tomorrow for the Democratic Debate Recap with Lou Rockwell. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.